over 100 deaths worldwide from severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, and a little more than 2,500 diagnosed cases. Today, a House committee heard from Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson and other health officials about how ready the U.S. health system is to deal with a possible SARS epidemic. Virginia's Tom Davis chaired the hearing. This portion is about 90 minutes. Uh, good morning, and quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I want to welcome everybody to today's oversight hearing on our public health system's response capabilities at the federal, state, and local level to manage uh, an emerging infectious disease. The global outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, provides a valid test of the nation's preparedness to handle any public health threat, whether it is caused by a naturally occurring infectious outbreak or bioterrorist attack. The Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act uh, provided substantial new funding for states, localities, and hospitals to boost preparedness to respond to highly contagious disease. Uh, the SARS threat is the first challenge to our nation's health network capabilities. It provides us with a chance to evaluate existing procedures and safeguards. SARS has brought fear and confusion to everyone's lives, particularly international travelers, airline crews, healthcare workers. <clears throat> Currently, there is no known cure and the disease is easily communicable. In a precautionary effort to prevent further spread of the disease, President Bush signed an executive order on Friday, April 4th, authorizing the use of quarantine if necessary. The President's unprecedented actions prove how serious the threat of SARS epidemic is to our country. SARS is believed to have originated in China in the fall of 2002. It has since spread to 17 countries. As of today, there have been over 2,600 SARS cases reported worldwide with 98 deaths. In the U.S., the number of cases continues to rise. Today, this country has approximately 148 suspected cases in 30 different states, with the highest concentrations in New York and California. Fortunately, no deaths have been reported. Uh, we have actually seen two suspected cases of SARS nearby in Northern Virginia. I am pleased that we will hear testimony from the Director of the Loudoun County Health Department, who is responsible for the treatment of a SARS patient in early February. Uh, it is important for our Nation's public health infrastructure to recognize what lessons can be learned from the SARS uh, threat. I have a fairly lengthy uh, statement that I would ask unanimous consent go on the record. And we have a great selection of witnesses to provide testimony this morning. Secretary Thompson is going to provide the very latest information on this virus and will discuss efforts being taken at the Federal level to respond to SARS. Uh, he will also describe preparedness coordination efforts with State and local authorities. Joining us in our second panel will be uh, Janet Heinrich, uh, Director of Public Health Issues for GAO. Um, she will discuss the GAO report released this week. Uh, the GAO report is timely and very applicable to the current SARS threat. Dr. Margaret Hamburg, former Commissioner of Health for the City of New York, recently co-chaired an Institute of Medicine committee that produced a noteworthy report on microbial uh, threats to health. Uh, and finally, uh, Dr. Goodfriend, Director of the Loudoun County Health Department, will be sharing us his experience in their, their uh, first suspected case of SARS. Um, I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing before the committee. As I said, everyone's statement will go in the record. Uh, Secretary Thompson is limited here until 11.30, so we want to move quickly to your testimony. What I'm going to ask is that Mr. Waxman give a statement for the minority, our Vice Chairman, Mr. Shays, give a statement. All their statements will be put in the record. Is there an objection to that? If, if not, uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for, thank you for particularly for holding this hearing today on SARS, which is a highly contagious and potentially deadly new disease that has infected more than 2,600 patients in 17 countries and claimed over 100 lives. Today in Hong Kong, just a single flight away from the United States, it, the schools are closed. Residents of a city apartment building are living in vacation camps, which is a euphemism for quarantine. And police are searching the streets for people who are contacts with infected uh, patients. This emerging epidemic reminds us, as Dr. Fauci of the NIH said to the committee last week that nature is the most danger, but dangerous bioterrorist. At a time when it's unclear how much damage this epidemic will do in the United States, we have an urgent need to answer many important questions. There are questions of biology, how did SARS come about, and what infection agent is the cause. There are questions of secrecy, why did China fail to tell the truth about the epidemic in its early stages? And what can we do to assure international cooperation in the future? 
There are questions of medical care. When will we have the drugs to treat the most seriously ill SARS patients? And what are the prospects for a vaccine? Today, we'll focus on a practical question. Is our country's public health system prepared for SARS? We cannot claim that there was no warning. We have many examples in the past decade uh, that were uh, a wake-up call and should have been a wake-up call on the breakdown of our nation's public health system and its vulnerability to new infections. Over the last decade, our nation has taken some important steps to combat emerging infections. Uh, even, e as we look back at the history from the um, uh, hantavirus to the um, epidemic of Nile, West Nile virus and the feared bird flu uh, that led to the slaughter of chickens in Hong Kong, all these warnings uh, have, have been uh, presented to us. And over the last decade, we've tried to respond to it. The Centers for Disease Control and other agencies have bolstered their disease surveillance around the world. With U.S. support, the World Health Organization has developed an international system for identifying and responding to new diseases. In 2002, Congress appropriated $1.1 billion for bioterrorism preparedness at the state and local levels. The intent was that this money would go to shore up our public health infrastructure, uh, and uh, that uh, is important that uh, we do that. Despite these efforts, however, significant weaknesses remain. In October 2001, an investigation by my staff revealed critical shortages in hospital surge capacity. In March of this year, the Institute of Medicine followed up its landmark 1992 report with a warning that while 13,000 to 15,000 public health investigators and scientists are needed at the local level, many barriers exist to prevent public health agencies from hiring qualified staff. The IOM recommended the nation take dramatic steps to improve surveillance, enhance response, and reduce antibiotic resistance. And just this week, GAO found that many health officials lack guidance from the federal government on what, needs to, what they need to do to be prepared. It's not hard to understand why we've neg neglected core public health functions. There's very little uh, uh, political appeal to the nuts and bolts of epidemiology, laboratory capacity, communication systems, planning, and assuring adequate hospital capacity. By comparison, it's much easier to attract attention and funding to magic bullet technology solutions. By any measure, our, our investment in state and local public health efforts pales next to what we are contemplating spending on drugs, antidotes, and vaccines for bioterrorist agents. I'm not saying we should not spend money for those uh, vaccines and other agents. Of course, we should. But as the SARS epidemic makes abundantly clear, a critical aspect of our response is the ability of the public health system to recognize disease and contain it. That's why I believe Congress must do more than investigate SARS. We must take concrete steps to shore up our public health infrastructure as soon as we can. Then we must sustain this commitment for the long term. As a starting place, Congress should adequately fund the smallpox vaccination effort so that critical resources are not diverted from core public health functions. We should also make sure that the public health threats are addressed adequately in the BioShield proposal. And I commend Chairman Davis for the interest he expressed in this issue at last Friday's hearings. I'm pleased that we are holding this bipartisan hearing today and that Secretary Thompson is with us. I also note that we have a very distinguished second uh, panel of witnesses, and I very much look forward to their testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Thompson. Uh, Mr. Shays has agreed to put his statement in the record so we can get right to you. Would you stand, please, and be sworn if we it's customary of this uh, committee? Tell me, swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Secretary Thompson, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so very much for holding this hearing. Uh, uh, Congressman Waxman, Congressman Shays, and uh, Congressman Burton, all the rest of the members of this distinguished panel, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I'm especially appreciative of my good friend, uh, Governor Bill Jankel, being on this committee. So I know I'm in good, shed, good stead. But uh, Wait on the questions. Jankel is tough on the questions. <laughs> uh, Members of this committee, thank you so very much for inviting me. And I also would like to introduce uh, 
General, retired General uh, Phil Russell, who was the commander of USM, uh, and um, also uh, Dr. Steve Osterhoff from CDC. I'm going to have to leave at 1130 because I'm meeting with all the vaccine manufacturers on SARS back in the office. I had set up this meeting. They're coming in, and I feel I have to go back at that particular time. And I appreciate this opportunity of giving a statement. But Dr. Steve Osterhoff is going to stay and answer any questions after, if there still are questions after I leave. My colleagues and I are committed to doing everything we possibly can to protect the health of all Americans. Uh, right now, responding to the SARS outbreak is one of our top priorities. I also would like to just uh, invite each and every member of this committee to stop over to the department at your convenience to see our uh, brand new communication war room in which we detect and which we are able to monitor diseases and storms across the, across the world. And I would appreciate if you'd stop over. I'm confident that if you come over, it would allay a lot of your fears. Uh, uh, Congressman Chase has been over to see it, and I think he will confirm that it is uh, state of the art. It's probably the most technologically advanced uh, command center in the, in, the, in the world. And I would appreciate if you'd all come over and see it. But right now, responding to the SARS outbreak is one of our top priorities. More than 250 researchers and staff from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are working around the clock in laboratories and on location in several affected nations to understand this new disease, devise appropriate protections, and work with state and local health departments in their efforts to do the same. Scientists from the National Institutes of Health are working with their colleagues at CDC as well as the World Health Organization in order to develop diagnostic tests and explore a broad range of ideas for treatment and the possible development of vaccines. It was the researchers at CDC, ladies and gentlemen, who identified the virus that we think causes SARS, a, cor a coronavirus. A lot of other laboratories around the world thought it was a paramyxovirus and made that uh, determination. It was our doctors at CDC that said no, it doesn't look like a paramyxovirus, it looks more like the coronavirus. So I think we're very much in debt to the wonderful doctors that we have working for the department and for the nation. It obviously identifies the virus as critical to the development of antivirals as well as vaccines. As you probably know, Mr. Chairman, it looks like SARS began in the Guangdong province in China last fall, uh, probably in November of last year. From there, it apparently spread to one floor of a hotel in Hong Kong by a physician from Guangdong who was also a professor who became infected while he was treating people at Guangdong province who himself became ill and subsequently died caring for the patients. He uh, stayed on the ninth floor of the Maripal Hotel in Guanglun province in Hong Kong. He happened to stay in room 911, which got us very suspicious. And uh, we uh, were able to find out and follow up. And we are fairly uh, confident that there's no human involvement, no bioterrorism attack whatsoever in regards to the SARS epidemic. We're trying to improve our understanding of the condition of this man, ladies and gentlemen, in the residence hotel floor. It was amazing that the seven individuals that he infected, infected on that floor are the individuals that went out and transmitted the disease to Bangkok, to Hanoi, uh, to Singapore and to Toronto. And uh, four out of the seven individuals that were infected from that one doctor who also died, also subsequently died. So it was very much a, what we would have called a super transmitter was this doctor that transmitted to the individuals on the ninth floor of the Maripal Hotel. Uh, the residents of this hotel floor, in order to learn more about how this disease is spread, unfortunately, the infection was carried to other countries by these travelers who stayed on that floor at the same time. Uh, worldwide, thousands of people have already been infected and 103 have died. Approximately 4 percent, about 3.9 percent of those infected are the individuals that have fatally uh, died from this disease, which put it in proper perspective, uh, during the worldwide uh, pandemic flu epidemic of 1918, it was about 3.5 to 3.8 percent of the people died, which of course caused uh, somewhere between 25 and 40 million people die, and about 518,000 in America. As of yesterday, there were 154 suspected cases in the United States. We can be thankful that all of them are still alive. Of those 154, definitive diagnostic information is currently only available from five of the cases as demonstrated by two different laboratory tests, 
Four have evidence of coronavirus antibodies indicating that they were indeed exposed to this novel virus. One had a positive culture of the virus of the 154. 53 have been hospitalized at some point, but only one of the individuals out of 154 required a ventilator. 31 have tested positive for pneumonia. So let me stress that these are suspected cases. Once we have a good test, many of them may turn out not to have had SARS at all. We, we expanded our definition so we would make sure that we got all those individual potential cases so that we could start controlling and making sure they would not infect other people. So out of the 154, we do not have definite tests on all of them, so there may, may be more than likely a probability uh, was quite high that it'll be much less than 154 when we finally get up. We had one additional case as of yesterday. Other countries have not been as fortunate. According to the World Health Organization, the worldwide SARS total, not counting the United States, is 2,523 cases as of midnight last evening. We'll have an update at 3 o'clock this afternoon when the World Health Organization reports in. The early symptoms of SARS are a fever, of more than 100.4 degrees, a headache, muscle ache, and a cough. People with severe cases may have difficulty breathing. CDC has asked people who have these symptoms to consult a health care provider for a diagnosis. The incubation period from exposure to symptoms is probably somewhere between two and seven days, though a few reports suggest up to 10 days. That's why we have indicated that people that have uh, the indications, the symptoms of it, we ask them to stay isolated for 10 days. SARS seems to be transmitted by coughing, droplets, by sneezing, and by personal contact. American health care providers have been very good about protecting themselves while interacting with patients that they suspect are suffering from SARS. They've also provided excellent supportive care. As we speak, CDC and NIH are developing three diagnostic tests, which we will soon be able to send to state laboratories as soon as they are ready and FDA approved. Two antibody systems require two samples of serum, one taken as early as possible and the other about three weeks later. When comparing these two samples from a given patient, it is possible to tell who has been exposed to this virus. We're also developing a polymerase chain reaction test, or PCR for short, for use as a diagnostic test, all developed at CDC in Atlanta. Rapid and accurate communications are absolutely crucial to ensuring a prompt and a coordinated response to any infectious disease outbreak. For this reason, strengthening communication among clinicians, emergency rooms, infection control practitioners and hospitals Pharmaceutical companies and public health personnel have been of the utmost paramount importance to CDC for some time. And in the past three weeks, CDC has held multiple teleconferences with state health officials to give them the latest information on SARS spread, as well as the implementation of enhanced surveillance and infection control guidelines. CDC has also appreciated receiving their input in the development of these measures and processes. In addition, ladies and gentlemen, we have issued travel advisories to people returning from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Vietnam. There are about uh, uh, 70, 70 uh, flights coming in from uh, the affected countries. We hand out these particular pamphlets to each, pa uh, each passenger as they come off the airplane and be able to give them information, telling them what they should do, how they should uh, uh, conduct themselves, how they should control this disease if they come down with it. It's very good. We've expanded our, uh, our surveillance from eight ports to 22 ports as of today. In addition, we've issued these travel advisories to people returning from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Vietnam. We've distributed now more than 200,000 of these health alert notice cards to airline passengers entering the United States from these areas. What these do alert passengers that they may have been exposed to SARS. Mr. Chairman, these cards advise people to monitor health for 10 days and to consult a doctor if they develop fever or respiratory symptoms. So far, Mr. Chairman, the lessons that we can draw from SARS are that surveillance is absolutely critical 
and that surveillance works. Early detections of a pattern of symptoms have been able to give scientists critical time to start investigating this disease. In addition, we know that we have much more to learn about this virus and this disease so that we can develop the tools that we need to prevent, treat, and contain it. We continue to work around the clock and to learn more about every aspect of SARS. I want to assure you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that this is not business as usual. We will not rest until we understand how to detect, treat, and prevent this disease. I look forward to your questions and thank you once again, Mr. Chairman, for giving me this opportunity to appear in front of you. Secretary Thompson, thank you very much. Uh, that was a pretty complete statement. I, I have a, just a brief question or two before I yield to Mr. Waxman and try to give everyone a question. H how do we, ins to ensure the safety of our health care workers who might have come in contact with a SARS patient, um, we can issue bulletins and everything else, but as you get out into places like Loudoun County and some of the rural areas, people who have traveled, uh, you know, who knows who, you, who they come in contact with. Our first responders, such as paramedics, uh, provided with protective gear, uh, what other precautionary measures can we use and get the word out? Uh, that they may be handling a potential SARS patient. Congressman Davis, we have, we're hooked up to 90 percent of the health departments right now through the CDC and through uh, the command center, which I hope you come over and see at the department. Mm -hmm. uh, every Friday we give out a report, the MMWR, uh, talking about uh, current uh, uh, diseases, infectious diseases and so on. The last two reports have been totally uh, on SARS, how you protect yourself. We ask people to wear masks, the health care workers to wear masks, as well as goggles, because we're not sure. But there may be the potential they can get in, the infection can get in through the eyes as well. We also, of course, have every health worker wearing gloves. We also are putting out advisories how people can take care of people that may be infected in the home with the potential of SARS, about uh, washing and about controlling any kind of diseases whatsoever, and that the individual that is a suspect for SARS should be wearing a mask. We what get this information out throughout the, yeah. throughout the country. We're also putting out a, a video for all the airplanes coming in that we're filming it today that's going to be put out, that's going to be shown to all passengers on uh, planes coming in from the affected countries. And that's really the critical part, is to stop the importation of this uh, from correct. other countries coming in at this point. That's why we put out the advisory about uh, travel conditions to other countries. That's why we're handing these out for all those individual passengers coming back from affected countries. And that's why we're putting out so much information to health care workers throughout the country. Thank you very much. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, I I'm concerned that we passed a bioterrorist bill, <clears throat> and that's supposed to help the local, state, and uh, local governments be able to deal with any emergency. They're using funds for a potential smallpox epidemic, but they're not adequately funded for that. But while they're spending money doing that, which comes to $200 a vaccine per person for first responders, I worry whether we're shortchanging the infrastructure to deal with a SARS epidemic. And I'd like to know what is the administration doing to assure that state and local governments do not have to sacrifice preparation for public health emergencies like SARS in order to prepare for a possible smallpox atta attack. And uh, Thank I, you, might, I might take note that the IOM, Institute of Medicine, GAO, and the HHS Inspector General all found major gaps in public health readiness at the state and local levels. Thank you very much for the question. Let me, let me uh, first off uh, thank you for your support on improving the infrastructure on the local state public health systems. You and I both know that we have uh, avoided too long in investing the dollars necessary to have a real, complete, comprehensive local state public health system. Now, thanks to you, thanks to all members of Congress on a bipartisan basis last year, you appropriated $1.1 billion, of which we sent out faster, I believe, than any department has ever sent out the dollars to local and state health departments. And uh, I am sad to be able to report to you that only 20 percent of that money has now been actually drawn down out of the federal treasuries, and the states have that opportunity to do so. And California, for instance, has only drawn down approximately uh, 59 percent, uh, which is much higher, but is undrawn 
still is about 41 percent of the dollars that they can draw. So is it your contention that, well, th that there's enough money for no, the state no, and local government to handle all the possible health emergencies? If you let me finish, I, I can explain it to Congressman. Secondly, we have an additional $1.5 billion that we can send out right now. And we're going to be sending 20 percent of that $1.5 billion out right now. And we're telling the advisories going out that states should use some of this money to pay for their smallpox. The third thing is, is in the budget resolutions going through, there's $60 million approximately set aside, a little, I think it was $55 million to be exact, set aside for smallpox on top of that 20 percent, plus there's $16 million set aside for SARS in the budget resolution. If there was going to be any addition, I would think that maybe we want to bump up that SARS to $25 million, but that is a decision that you and other members of the But right now, I would encourage you and other members to ha contact your state governors to start drawing down more of this money that we have because we're in the process of sending out an additional $1.5 billion this year. And this is still fiscal year 2002 funds. Mr. Secretary, I, I appreciate your sincerity in trying to make sure that we don't have gaps in our public health infrastructure. And right. I know you're doing what you can, but I worry that we're not doing enough. When we hear from the Institute of Medicine, the General Accounting Office, and others who say that there's ma there are major gaps and that we're spending money to deal with a smallpox uh, possible epidemic, as we appropriately should, yeah. and then they uh, come back and tell us that they don't think that uh, we're prepared uh, if there's a surge in need for hospitals uh, to deal with a, uh, an emergency like uh, a SARS epidemic, that there's a capacity to deal with it, that there's enough, there are enough inspectors and, uh, to uh, uh, to go out and find out uh, whether uh, the, 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 whether they can find the people that uh, need to be found, I, I just would point out to you that th that uh, the reports we're getting are that uh, we're not doing enough. Do you feel that we're doing ev everything we should be doing? No, I, and I, I'll never say that, uh, Congressman. But I'm telling you right now, there's money available right now for states to draw down. As far as hospitals, last year we sent out $135 million. This year it's going to be $518 million for surge capacity for improvements. And uh, we could always use more, but this is a tremendous improvement. We have an additional $1.5 billion, including the 518 for hospitals to send out this year for fiscal year 2003, and only 20 percent of the money that we sent out last year has actually been drawn down. Now, the states could have allocated it and, not, uh, and are building for the infrastructure and haven't actually drawn down, but there's money in the pipeline and there's more going out, and plus out of the $101.5 billion, 20 percent part of that 20 percent can be used for smallpox. Let me so ask you I, I'm just saying, Congressman, there's yeah. money in the pipeline. We're working hard, and I would invite you to come over to the command center and see it, and I think we could allay a lot of your fears about all let, the things we're let doing. Let me ask you one last question. Last week, the President added SARS to the list of quarantinable communicable diseases. Uh, under what circumstances would you invoke your authority to order a quarantine? That, uh, that executive order has not been amended since 1983. This is the first time there was an, any addition to the executive order. Uh, the, it came about because a woman came back from Asia, and she landed in California. She came down sick on the plane. We asked her to go in and get an X-ray and be examined by our doctors. Uh, she refused. She got on a train to go to New Mexico, and we couldn't stop her. So we made a suggestion, went up through CDC, through my office, to the President, asking him to expand the executive order so we could do that. We would use our executive order, and I would use it in that kind of a question. We had a situation like that this past uh, couple days in New York, and uh, the state of New York used the authority and had this individual isolated. We don't use the word quarantine, it's isolation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary Thompson, for being here. I, uh, I view SARS as kind of a wake-up call, an, you know, a, a very real live fire exercise. This is, I believe, uh, highly contagious, and we don't have a cure. That's correct. Uh, I, I want to first know, in the incubation stage, can you spread the disease? Pardon? In the incubation stage, can you spread the disease? We're, we're almost certain that it can. 
Uh, I would like to know, um, when you talk about surveillance as being the most important issue, which I think is as well, let me just ask you this specific question, because I don't have the comfort level that we do have the surveillance yet. If I just took my hospitals in my district, Greenwich, Stanford, Norwalk, two in Bridgeport, one in Danbury, are you saying right now that you know every day uh, what they are experiencing, whether they have any outbreaks or not having outbreaks, or is it a little not gotten that sophisticated yet? We know every day that the hospitals report in uh, their occupancy of the beds, the hospitals report in to CDC on, on their particular cases, but... Uh, every hospital? I believe it's every hospital in the state. Um, well, in, in, in particular, in Connecticut, uh, you know, the most, in most appropriately, that type of... Your mic is not on, sir. Sorry. Yep. Most appropriately, that information goes to the state health department. And in Connecticut, there's, a, there's an excellent system whereby um, the state monitors all of the hospitals uh, within the state of Connecticut With, for a, unusual on a, on illness. On a real-time basis of what? Uh, on a real-time basis, correct. Um, they, they are one of, the state of Connecticut is one of our emerging infections programs recipient right. sites, I know and that's the, the claim. type of activity they're doing. I'm sorry, I have only five minutes. I know the claim. I'm just a little concerned that in reality that's not happening. So uh, how would you know? Uh, it, do you have to get your information from the state? We do get our information from the state. We have a highly collaborative working relationship with them. And if there was an unusual event within the state of Connecticut, we feel quite confident that they would contact us. Yeah. It, the problem is unusual. It, it, it may only be unusual if you compare from a lot of different places and then you see that maybe a pattern is happening. Um, and so uh, I, I want to know very specifically if there is an outbreak of some kind, but rather small in Stanford, so they don't think it's necessarily a big deal, but there may be something in Bridgeport, I'm just taking my own communities, would that be instantly or daily uh, transmitted to, I mean, uh, in, would the state be informed? And would you be informed as well uh, out of courtesy or legal requirement? There isn't a legal requirement that the states report to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, those types of outbreaks. They would do it as a courtesy. Um, uh, we, again, this is a very highly collaborative interaction and relationship that we Why have with Why wouldn't we them. want it legally required? Why wouldn't we want to legally require it? I mean, why would we even want to leave a doubt? Because this whole system, it strikes me, is only going to work if you can contain it and box it in and you know about it soon enough. So is that something that uh, is being considered? I think we should consider it, uh, yeah. Congressman. I you don't have any executive order to demand it? No, we do not. OK, and that's important but, to know. But we, but we really have great co collaboration and cooperation, especially since we got the new dollars. We were hooked up through the Health Alert Network. Uh, with 90 percent of the health departments, and we have con we have regular communication I guess with them, the stakes, and we have also the laboratory's capacity. The stakes are so high that I don't think this should be a model that is done by just general understanding. I think there should be legal requirements, and if you don't do it, some penalties, frankly, because I think the stakes are very high. I have tremendous confidence with CDC. I have tremendous confidence in NIH. WHO, World Health Organization, I think is a phenomenal organization. I think it is under-resourced. Do you agree that it is a huge um, and important element to our ability to protect the United States? The World Health Organization? Yes. Absolutely. And, uh, and we had direct collaboration with them. In fact, we had, uh, we've had within the last 10 days, we've had at least four teleconferences with the World Health Organization, with NIH, FDA, CDC, and the Secretary's Office. What kind of resources is our government giving a World Health Organization? I think we, uh, I'm not sure, but I think it's about 50 percent of their budget, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Do you think it's enough? Do you think we should do more? Uh, I think that at this point in time, uh, I, I didn't expect to answer this question, but I would say off the top of my head, after being on the Board of Directors, I think it's enough. Okay. Thank I you, think other, I think other countries should be given I, did, I just want to quickly state that I know you're doing a great job, and I know you're working hard. You're using the laws that you have right now, but I do think that you need to have some authority that, that is clear 
and, and no doubts about it, and it isn't not just on a gentleman or gentle lady's understanding. I think that's true. I agree thank you. with you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, could I, just, could I just say one yeah. thing to you, Congressman, in uh, response to a couple questions you asked Steve? We also have a, a cooperative uh, arrangement with the hospitals. If there's a mysterious illness in the hospital, they're supposed to get their specimens to the state laboratory and there's also a concurrent specimen uh, to the CDC laboratory. We also have leased planes in which we can fly epidemiologists from Atlanta to a hospital at any particular time, any time a mysterious illness comes in, and we have used that. We've had some false alarms on smallpox that we've sent our epidemiologists into several communities, and we've been able to do that on a regular basis. As soon as something comes in, we have told the hospitals and the emergency uh, wards throughout America, you got something suspicious, don't wait, don't tarry, call us. And it only we'll works though if they tell you. Pardon? It only works if they tell you. That's right. It only works if they contact us. Thank you. Ms. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all of the panelists for your important testimony. And it seems that uh, Laurie Garrett's predictions in her book, Betrayal of Trust, have uh, come true. And I'd, I'd like uh, permission to put in the record a, an article from the New, New England Journal of Medicine. And in that uh, article, it, it asks if we can possibly respond fast enough uh, to contain this epidemic and to, quote, from the article, if the virus moves faster than our scientific communications and control capacities, we could be in for a long, difficult race against SARS. The race is on, the stakes are high, and the outcome cannot be predicted. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I, I uh, want to know, I represent New York, and uh, we have uh, mm -hmm. 8 million people in a very small area. How contagious is SARS. I've, I've read articles that the, on the airlines you can catch it from someone who's infected that is sitting immediately next to you or in the immediate vicinity, but because of the sophisticated air handling system, all the passengers on the plane would not be at risk. But in terms of mass transit, uh, the subway systems that do not have the air handling system could someone get infected by riding on the same subway train? Can you speak about how contagious it is? Uh, there have been many, many articles about airlines, but not about subways, buses, other forms of, uh, uh, of, of, of meeting halls or other ways uh, that people could be contained. Congressman, I'm going to ask one of the other doctors to respond directly to it. But let me just uh, set it up this way and tell you how much we're doing, because I think that may allay some of your fears from New York as well as other ones. CDC is working around the clock. We have the best laboratories, the best scientists, the best doctors doing this. When the rest of the world was looking at this and came up with it and said, this is a paramyx of virus, it was our scientists that said, hey, wait a minute. We don't think so. We think it's the coronavirus. They are 99.9% .9 sure that it's the coronavirus, and that's thanks so, so you believe it's a natural occurring disease? Yes. It's not from any type of biological agent we, or anything? We are almost absolutely certain that it is. We're not 100%, but we're, we're going we're to get there, hopefully. But we're very, very certain that it's not biology. Secondly, we also, within, within the, the last three weeks, we've been able to come up with three tests. The first thing you have to do is you have to find out what the virus is. We were able to determine that at CD. The second thing we have to do is come up with a test. We've already come up with three tests we're, we're working on right now. We're hoping to be able to get an FDA approved very quickly, get that sent out to the state laboratories in New York and throughout the country so people can test. Of the 154 cases right now, we've only really tested approximately a handful. So we're, out of the 154, we're not sure all of those will be SARS. The probability is they will not be. And the third thing is we're still learning a great deal about this disease. As far as the infections, we believe that there are what we call super transmitters, like this doctor that was in the Maripal Hotel on the ninth floor and gave it to the seven individuals that went out and spread it throughout the world. He was what we would call a super transmitter. And now, as far as the medical, I would either ask Dr. Phil Russell or Dr. Steve Ostrom to tell you. But could, could I just follow up with another question very briefly? You, you said that it was similar to a cold. Uh, and what, The coronavirus what, is, the, is the family of the virus that causes the common cold. So, so if we haven't been able to develop a vaccine for colds, 
How can we develop a vaccine for SARS? As soon as I leave here, Dr. Phil Russell and I are meeting with all the vaccine companies. We've also asked all the pharmaceutical companies to come in with all of their research and all their antiviral medicines in the pipeline for us to be able to test. Everybody has been cooperating. We're not certain that we can come up with it. Our, our specialist thinks that we're, we're, I, we're working around the clock to do so. Steve, did you want to talk about the infection? Yeah, I, what, I would, what I would add to what the Secretary said is that um, we always have to keep our minds open. And, we're, and, and as he emphasized, we're still learning a lot about this particular virus as we go along. The predominance of the evidence that we have up to this point indicates to us that, as is the case with many other types of cold viruses, that direct very close contact with somebody else that's ill is probably the major mode of transmission. We always have to keep our minds open to the fact that in some situations where there are particularly sick people, that it might spread more widely than that. But like with most of these respiratory viruses, close contact, direct transmission uh, within, a, within a few feet seems to be the major way that this particular virus spreads. Congresswoman, we also have got uh, vaccines for the coronavirus for animals. And I'd like to ask Dr. Phil Russell to ex just to expand on that a little bit. That's true that the uh, coronavirus uh, genus has got many uh, members in, uh, in the animal kingdom, including uh, uh, causes of disease of, of uh, pigs and cats and, and so forth. Now, there have been some very successful uh, vaccines made uh, in, in the veterinary community uh, that are used on a regular basis. The virus also grows very well in, in the cell culture systems that are currently used for manufacturing vaccines. So we believe we have a, uh, an advantage here uh, that m might be able to be exploited. How fast we can do it and how successful we're going to be is, 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 remains to be seen. Thank you. My, my time Thank is you. up. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Indiana. I'm just going to ask uh, two quick questions and then uh, yield to Mr. Janklow for, one, for a question. Um, you're developing a vaccine. You're going to try to develop a vaccine for SARS. Uh, what about the people who are older or who have uh, immune problems already like AIDS patients or senior citizens who have problems like that? How are you going to deal with them uh, and help those who, who may get infected in the upper age levels? And are we going to use anything like, are you going to recommend anything such as eucalyptus, which is a, a, nor, a natural oil which has some properties that does fight some of these viruses? Dr. Phil Russell is probably one of the world's most noted virologists, and I would ask him to respond sure. directly to it. I think the populations you describe are at uh, a very high risk. And uh, whether we're going to be able to provide substantial help for uh, high-risk individuals uh, remains to be seen in the future. Uh, a, a very aggressive program uh, uh, attempting to uh, screen all the uh, potential antiviral drugs that we can get our hands on will be underway uh, soon. We've already uh, started. Um, there is some uh, reports that, that steroid uh, treatment uh, is of some use from the Chinese, or from the Hong Kong experience, uh, but I have a fundamentally very uh, pessimistic view of, of dealing with a, a, an acute severe virus illness uh, uh, in those populations you described. I think the uh, controlling the, uh, the spread of the disease uh, with a vaccine is probably our, our, best, uh, um, our best hope uh, after uh, we, uh, if, it, if it gets around all of our quarantine uh, and isolation methodology. I hope when they're looking at these vaccines and so forth, they'll look at some of the natural remedies that might be of assistance, like the eucalyptus and other, other things like that, just in the course of uh, looking into it to see if that might be a, a help. I think going forward, we're going to look at every possible okay. option. Okay. Mr. Janklo, I, I yield to you. This will be the last uh, question, Governor, because I know you have to leave, but we'll make this a governor to governor. Uh, question. Thank you very, very much. They're always mm. the toughest, I might add. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks for yielding. I, a quick question. The, uh, there have been about 3,000 cases worldwide. In those 3,000, in, in that period of time that you've become aware of it, you've put out 200,000 pamphlets on airplanes, you're preparing a tape, you've dealt with the isolation issues with respect to your legal authorities. In addition to that, you've had tel many teleconferences with state uh, officials. You've called the pharmaceutical reps together in a teleconference. You're now meeting with them. 
the point that I'm trying to make is that this is a phenomenal response. This is what you're doing exactly what everybody in America would expect. But my question is, what, have, have we pursued or will we pursue the reason that the Chinese government sat on this? Congressman Shea's question dealt with our hospitals reporting things to you. China sat on this, fibbed about it, covered it up, and, and now it may not be the time to deal with it, but will there be a time when this is addressed with China so this kind of problem with respect to world health can be dealt with in a more satisfactory manner? And is there anything we can do to assist in that process? I think it is the time to deal with it because uh, this started in Guangdong province in uh, late October, early November. And we had a very difficult time getting our people to get into Guangdong province. In fact, we didn't get in there until I think it was last Tuesday was the first day. It required uh, myself calling the Minister of Health, it required the World Health Organization putting on a, a tremendous amount of uh, pressure. It would require the CDC saying that we helped you set up a CDC counterpart, and we went through that avenue, and finally they came out. Uh, and uh, we didn't get our people in. It was led by Dr. Robert Freeman, uh, Br Dr. Robert Brenman from CDC, and he had to subsequently leave and go back. But now we got a Dr. Mark McGuire who is leading our, our efforts there. Uh, so they've opened up, and they have now come back, uh, Congressman Janklo, to contact us and say, we want more collaboration. In fact, they want us to go into Beijing, they want us to go into Shanghai and help them uh, diagnose this and help to control it. The Chinese have been very forthcoming since uh, last Tuesday, and they want more collaboration rather than less, which is unusual for the Chinese. So it seems that they have moved a great deal, plus the Minister of Health at a press conference and actually apologized, and we've never heard that happen before. So I think that's a, a good sign. Thank you very much. Governor, thank you. Uh, General Russell, I know you have to leave. Uh, Dr. Ostroff, I understand you're going to stay here for additional questions as we uh, move uh, to Mr. Rupersberger. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You ready to go? Uh, yeah, sure. I, oh, Clock's Dr. ticking. Ostroff. Okay, fine. Um, Restart it. We talk, the, the issue of outreach, uh, obviously we have the best doctors and, and researchers in the world and, uh, you know, we, we need uh, and we're helping them and, and I think we're doing a great job and I'm glad that we're on top of this. But what about the, pub, the, the plan for the public outreach uh, besides nightly newscast? Uh, uh, what, what the health departments, both local and state, how's, how does that work and what plan do we have? from a public outreach point of view to educate not only the public and the other governments, but also the physicians who, who might be dealing with these, these, uh, this problem? Well, we've used a variety of different mechanisms to try to make sure that we keep our frontline public health workers, that we keep our health care providers, and that we keep the public informed about what is happening not only here in the United States, but it's happening elsewhere. Uh, we've done this um, through having constant uh, press conferences and uh, telebriefings to all of our state health departments. Our, our website has a tremendous amount of information on SARS and uh, according to our public affairs people at CDC, that even in comparison to our experience with anthrax, uh, two years ago that the number of calls that our hotline is receiving from the public uh, exceeds the numbers that we had during the anthrax uh, um, uh, uh, outbreak in 2001. And in addition to that, our website is uh, getting um, uh, hundreds of thousands of hits over the course of uh, the last several weeks. So clearly, uh, the public is accessing the information that we have available. And we're using every modality that we can think of to keep the public informed about what is happening with this uh, syndrome. Do you rely more on state and local health departments to educate, say, physicians 
about what they need to look for, where, where you need to go, or is well, it more Well, we've, based on we've had uh, communications with all of the professional organizations as well, and we keep them informed about what's happening. And through the professional organizations, they've also been uh, keeping their membership informed about uh, what is happening with this disease. Uh, and uh, they've been distributing our information as well. Um, clearly, uh, we rely on a partnership with, uh, with uh, all of the states and with the local health departments to help us make sure that they get information to those who are out on the front line. Do you have a special team that goes into a certain location in the event that there is an outbreak? Uh, we, uh, we, we have many such teams it's at team. CDC. Um, it's important to point out that we always have to go in at the invitation of the State Health Department um, uh, in order to provide assistance to them in ha conducting those Have you had those problems types. with that in the past? Um, uh, I, I think that uh, on balance it's a highly collaborative working relationship and it continues to get better all the time. Okay. Thank you. You all set? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Ostroff. A couple of questions. One, you say that, that it started with the doctor on the ninth floor treating other folks. One, I don't know why he was treating the other folks unless they had something together. I don't, I don't know what. But how did it originate with that doctor? I mean, where did it come from? That's question one. Second question, you may not be able to answer because it um, refers to what Secretary Thompson said when I believe it was um, Mr. Waxman that asked him, were we doing enough? And he very quickly said, no. Well, if we're not doing enough, what else do we need to be doing? That's the second. And the third question is to you. When you responded to Mr. Shays, you talked about how great Connecticut was. Well, what about the other 49 states? <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Uh, in response to the first question, let me try to clarify the situation with the uh, physician who came to Hong Kong. He actually came to Hong Kong uh, to attend a family affair. Uh, he was from Guangdong province. Um, he was directly involved in the care of patients that were ill with the syndrome that was subsequently identified as SARS in Guangdong province. He had a family affair to attend in Hong Kong. Um, he and his wife traveled to Hong Kong. Uh, he wasn't directly taking care of people while he was uh, at the hotel. Um, he arrived ill. Um, he attended the family event. Uh, the following morning he was hospitalized and then 24 hours later he died. Um, we do know um, that a number of people that were staying at the hotel, as was pointed out, uh, subsequently became ill. And in addition to that, several of the other family members that attended the event that he was attending, which was a wedding, also became ill. And so um, that's how we think that this originated and that from his providing direct health care in China, um, uh, that to that's how he got exposed. Well, where did they get it? I mean, where did it start? Well, that's, that, that, egg, remains, where did it start? that remains a, a, a very significant question, which is to try to get back to the origins of the disease uh, in Guangdong province and to try to get back to some of the first patients that look like they had this syndrome, which, as the Secretary pointed out, appears to have occurred back in November. Um, the collaborators in China have identified um, those individuals that they consider to be the first identified cases in at least seven different locations in Guangdong province. And they actually have done a great deal of work, as has been relayed to us by the team that we had on the ground in Guangdong, uh, looking into the circumstances of those people to try to get some clues as to where this may have come from. Did you forget the other two questions? Oh, I'm sorry. The, um, the, the, the question about um, the um, uh, capacities in the other 49 states, uh, we have uh, cooperative agreements with all of the state health departments to try to um, work with them to enhance their capacities. Um, we have two types of programs. One is for basic epidemiology and laboratory capacity. All of the state health departments receive that assistance from us. And in a certain number of instances in 10 different locations around the United States, we have a more sophisticated program that's known as an emerging infections program whereby they can conduct their um, surveillance activities on a much more active basis. Um, so we have a number of different programs that we use to support all, all of our partners at the state level. 
are they pretty much up to speed, most of the states, all um, the states? Well, I think that the Secretary said it very appropriately that we're certainly, uh, we certainly have made great strides um, uh, over the last several years. That has come both from these types of resources as well as from the funds that are being used for bioterrorism because it's always been recognized that those funds are, are basically dual-use funds. They are used primarily for bioterrorism-related um, uh, activities, but they also are, are used by the states to build their intrinsic capacity to recognize both intentional as well as naturally occurring diseases. So I think all of those resources have been used to enhance capabilities. Um, I, and, and as I think we would all say, and I think you'll hear from our partners uh, at the state and local level, um, we, th this is a continuous process. We have to keep on building the system as we move forward. And I'll have to uh, refer the other question to Secretary Thompson, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, the orders that I have on the Democratic side are Watson, Lynch, Clay, and Norton, and I have Duncan, Murphy, and Janklow. If that's not correct, I need to be corrected. But Ms. Watson, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to thank uh, Tommy Thompson and his team for being here. Uh, during his presentation, the Secretary mentioned uh, the drawdown of money that uh, is proposed to be allocated and that uh, California has only drawn down 51 percent. Uh, I want to know what the process is for drawing down the money. Do they have to have a plan uh, proposed or in operation to be entitled to this money? Uh, that's my first question. And uh, I also want to know, is the smallpox threat a reality now to take precedence over the SARS threat? Because I dear, did hear, hear him mention that 20 percent of the monies can be used for smallpox. So if a state doesn't want to have that program uh, enforced, does that get in the way from getting the money for the other kind of uh, epidemics or bio you, right. threats? So if you could address those well, points. Well, let me try to address okay. uh, your questions. Uh, I certainly can't go into the same level of detail that the yes, Secretary did. I understand. But what I can tell you is that all of the states, as a condition of receiving the bioterrorism funds, had to uh, develop a very detailed plan. That detailed plan had to address a number of different issues. There were. I think 16 different priority areas that had to be developed in their uh, operational plans before any of the funds could be released. Uh, it was a, a, a very rapid process because we wanted to get the funding out there as, as quickly as we possibly could. Um, but over a process of a couple of months last year, all of the state plans were eventually uh, approved. And uh, once those approvals came through, then the states could start drawing upon the resources. In terms of your question about the threat of smallpox versus the threat of, of, of uh, something like SARS, um, I, it's, it's hard to compare and contrast because they're quite different threats. Um, what I can say to you is that we would consider both of them to be very important and, and both of them very much um, deserving of uh, enhancements in preparedness. Here is my concern. California is a Pacific Rim nation. It's the first stop when people are coming from Southeast Asia at LAX. And uh, the airlines might hand out or that yellow card might be handed out. And I was wondering if there is any requirement for them to hand out the mask. It makes sense to me that if you're going to fly across the Pacific Ocean, the number of hours that it takes, six to eight hours, we, we ought to be giving out face masks if they come from one of the affected areas. But my other problem is, in trying to think it through as I was listening to the testimony, is that we're having a tremendous uh, problem meeting the deficit in California. We're closing in my county, Los Angeles, <coughs> we're closing the clinics, the public health clinics. That's where the indigents are taken care of. And uh, is there some way to expedite the um, 
applications for this money so that we can get it out there? Uh, can they proceed the detailed planning? Because we're closing our clinics. And the threat is greater on the coastal areas of the United States, particularly on the West Coast. And I'm thinking that the paperwork that's required, I've been in government for a long time, slows that process down. So can you, and I'm throwing these things right. out to because they're on my mind, so. Well, well in, in, in response to the second part of your question, we've tried to move as expeditiously as we possibly could once the money became available uh, to make sure that the states had developed their plans and that uh, um, the plans were approved by us uh, so that we could move the resources as rapidly as we possibly could. In response to the first part of your question concerning the issue of, of masks and other ways of potentially preventing transmission, and I think in, in response to some of the questions that um, uh, Congressman Davis uh, also raised concerning specific guidance for various types of groups, we've been working very, very hard uh, to develop recommendations and guidance for all types of situations, including airlines, um, including um, uh, emergency responders, et cetera, so that they would have information about what's appropriate to do um, in terms of protecting themselves from potential exposure. In terms of the guidance that, that both we and the World Health Organization have provided around airline circumstances, um, we do not routinely recommend that people wear masks. The emphasis in the airline setting has been the prompt identification of somebody who may potentially be ill, isolating that passenger from the rest of the passengers, uh, preferably placing a mask on the ill individual rather than all of the other passengers. How, excuse me, I, if you allow me, how in the world would you know when I have come out of the Far East, there are hundreds, and I know my time is up. I'll just finish with this, if you Thank don't you. mind. One second. How would you know in the crowds that are coming through, getting on those planes? I think we ought to err on the side of requiring, because you could be sitting next to that infected person that showed no signs as they come up to the desk, go through security. Who is there checking them out? And I just throw that out. Uh, think about it. You don't even have to respond. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady, and uh, this time the chair recognizes Mr. Falcon. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And actually, uh, my first question is somewhat related to uh, that last uh, line. Uh, how, how difficult is this to diagnose, and I is there some simple test or procedure, or can it be quickly, easily identified, or is it something that it takes a test that you have to send off and wait a day or two? Well, up until two weeks ago, we didn't even know what right. the potential cause was. And so it's only once you, uh, once you, uh, you identify what the causative agent might be that you can develop, start developing tests um, that would be um, directed specifically against that diagnosis. Um, the syndrome itself, um, uh, particularly early on, um, is pretty nonspecific. Um, it looks like many other types of respiratory illnesses, and so there's nothing, at least initially, that distinguishes it from other types of diseases. That's why we've gone to such great lengths to use a, a very wide net in terms of being able to recognize people with the appropriate travel histories so that we can take the appropriate precautions and make sure that we can reduce the risk to the minimum possible um, uh, to have them potentially transmit to other individuals. As far as where we are with the diagnostic tests, we've been making great strides since we identified the coronavirus two weeks ago to develop these tests. Right now, uh, these tests are being refined in our laboratories in Atlanta. And when we're at the point where we think that the tests perform the way that we think the test ought to perform, both in terms of recognizing people who really have the disease as well as excluding people who don't, then we will begin distributing it to all of the states so that they can more rapidly make the diagnosis appropriately. Well, hopefully uh, uh, we're going to be able to come up with some way to uh, contain or, and, and eradicate this disease uh, very shortly. but. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, what, what other steps can we take if we don't come up with something uh, 
very quickly because uh, obviously you, you mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, you're getting more calls and more hits on your website than even the anthrax scare, which was a pretty big scare. And I think you said, what, 100,000 hits or Hundreds something? Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. So obviously the concern is very great. And the West Coast, of course, uh, is, is the front line, I suppose. But uh, we have people flying in from all over the world in my hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee, and all over the country. Uh, what what can we do if, if, if this thing starts to explode in, so, in say, uh, uh, some country? Can, can we um, require that all passengers coming in from that country be tested or, or something done before they start spreading this all around the country? Or what can we do? Right. Well, before we get to that point, we have to have the test and we have to make sure the test works the way that we, we think that it ought to work. Because some of these people right. may be carrying this without realizing right. it. Right. One of the things that the World Health Organization has recommended is that on the embarkation end, when people are getting on airplanes um, uh, from the areas in which there's evidence that there's local transmission occurring, that these passengers in some way, shape, or form be screened before they get on the airplane so that ill individuals can be recognized and make sure right. that they don't get on the airplane in the That's first good. place. And then in addition to that, they've provided this information about what to do if somebody may not necessarily have been sick at the time they got on board, but if they become sick en route. Um, in terms of, of what happens if this does explode and gets bigger and bigger and we run into situations like have been seen in some other parts of the world, I think the best defense against, against that is some of the things that Secretary Thompson uh, and General Russell mentioned in terms of trying to come up with specific therapeutics and trying to come up with, uh, with um, um, preventative measures that we can use to prevent people from getting the disease in the first place. They obviously will take some time uh, to get into that position, um, but, but hopefully that would um, uh, enhance the tools that we have available to control this in the future. Well, I think uh, Chairman Chase made a good point in saying that we maybe need to give, uh, give you some more authority, especially to uh, do things uh, for uh, concerning people who fly in from these other countries if this thing gets uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and uh, also leading uh, ranking member uh, Waxman for your leadership on this issue. I want to thank the secretary for coming in and also uh, you, doctor. I heard you mention in your earlier testimony that we, you know, having people on the ground in, in Guangdong province. And uh, while I have not been in, in Guangdong province in, in over two years, uh, I am quite familiar with, with the city of Guangzhou and the province itself. Now, we probably have close to 7 million people in, in the city of Guangzhou. It's the provincial capital. You have one of the major regional markets there. Uh, and while I, I need to be mindful of the cultural sensibilities, uh, environmentally and uh, from a public health standard, those systems have been compromised in that city. It is just simply overwhelmed. Also, and to my point, we have the major U.S. and European adoption center located at the White Swan Hotel right in the middle of Guangzhou. And on an average weekend there, uh, and I've seen it with my own eyes, you might have anywhere from three to 500 families coming in. Usually one parent comes in, adopts the child, flies out the same weekend. And uh, all of this is exacerbated by the China one child policy and the fact that the Chinese government has taken really a uh, kind of closed one eye to the, to the adoption process and they're sort of doing this thing without recognizing they're doing it. Uh, we've got a, a situation there that is not adoption as we would view it in this country, you're really looking at a humanitarian uh, effort there and we're rescuing kids, we're saving their lives. And I have in my district uh, recently uh, a, a woman and her sister went over and, and adopted uh, a young child, which is fairly customary, and uh, came back and now the child is infected and, and the sister is infected as well in Springfield, Mass. Uh, my question is this, given the whole situation there, uh, 
Do we have any protocol in place uh, to address that situation? Have we allocated any additional resources to state or to anybody else, to your own people, uh, to, to help that situation, uh, given the fact that these adoptions need to go forward and we need to protect our people? Right. Thank you very much, Congressman, for asking that question. We, too, have been very concerned about that situation because the virtually all uh, international adoptions from China come from that particular uh, region of the country. Um, we have been working uh, on a highly collaborative basis with the international adoption agencies um, that deal um, with um, uh, adoptees from China, with all of them. There are a number of them in the United States. Uh, to make sure that we have protocols in place so that uh, we can provide information uh, to the parents before they go over there uh, about what measures they can take to reduce their risk. And we've been uh, also working quite um, um, well with all of these agencies in collaboration with our states and, and our local health departments to make sure that we can monitor these children as they do come um, so that we can minimize any potential impact not only from the child but also from potentially the parents. And so we've recognized this as a considerable issue and we've been working quite strenuously to make sure that we address it in the most sensitive and appropriate way. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Janklow, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do doctor, in, 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 in uh, Secretary Thompson's testimony on, on page 7, uh, they talk about uh, um, this is a very infectious, SARS is very infectious um, during the symptom symp symptomatic phase of the disease. Then it goes on to say, however, we do not know how long the period of contagion lasts once they recover from the illness. Uh, we do not know whether or not they can spread the virus before they, ex before they experience symptoms. The information our epidemiologists have, su have suggests the period of contagion may begin with the very onset of the earliest symptoms of the viral disease. Then on page 8, it says, people who are living in a home with a SARS patient who are otherwise well, there's no reason to limit activities currently. Well, uh, wh why do we draw that conclusion, sir, if we don't know at what stage it's transmitted? And are we suggesting to people that it's okay if you live with a SARS patient to just go on about your business around the community if, in fact, it's maybe transmittable before you have any of the manifestations of the onset of the uh, illness? You understand what I'm saying? Right. No, I understand, Congressman. Um, we, we have been uh, very rapidly um, accumulating a great deal of information, not only here in the United States, but also through our teams that are working uh, overseas where most of these cases are occurring to try to answer some of the questions that you're raising. Uh, and the way to do this is through the collection of serial specimens. But, but, but sir, if we're telling people don't go to Hanoi, don't go to Guangdong, uh, Guangzhou, don't go to uh, um, Hong Kong, but, but if you have a SARS patient in your house, you can go out and go to the supermarket. Is it, I mean, how's the public supposed to understand what it is that we really think is the cause for concern? Right. Well, looking at the situation here in the United States, um, uh, you know, most of our cases um, are um, considerably milder than what's been seen in other parts of the world. Obviously, for those individuals who are ill, most of these people have been put in the hospital appropriately and have been put in appropriate isolation. In instances where there are some of these milder cases, um, as, as a uh, routine recommendation, we've, we've made the recommendations that these individuals stay at home, remain uh, in their homes, and for family members of these individuals that are living in the same household, that they monitor themselves for illness. In the absence of illness, however, we do not recommend that they self-isolate themselves you, at home. Uh, uh, and I'm not trying to argue with you, but you're, the testimony indicates that if someone is a SARS patient that, and they're cared for at home, that they should stay at home for at least 10 days Correct. after they're no longer symptomatic. Correct. If they should stay at home for 10 days, 
aren't we really pushing our luck to suggest it's okay for the family members to come and go and wander around the community while, while I'm staying at home for 10 days after I have no more symptoms? Well, uh, until there is information to suggest that that isn't the correct thing to do, okay. we have difficulty making recommendations that non-ill people stay at home. Now, this is an important point because in some other countries they indeed have taken measures based on their local circumstances to restrict well individuals that have been contacts of SARS patients um, from uh, going into the community. Uh, at this point, we have not seen okay. any reason to do that in this country, and, and, and so far this has worked quite well here in the United States. Doctor, some of the literature we were given says uh, coronaviruses can mutate and change rapidly. This is the reason why this virus stand was not included in this year's influenza vaccine. Is that really a conclusion by somebody? Well, one, influenza vaccine has nothing to do with coronavirus. Okay, I'm just there. reading the census that was given me in the briefing paper. Right. Uh, there, there, there are two completely types of, different types of viruses. The influenza vaccine has, th has, 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 uh, um, is directed against three different types of influenza only. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier, there are no human vaccines against coronaviruses. Okay. Thank you. It's time the chair recognizes Mr. Clay. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, uh, in, in a 1992 report uh, on microbial threats to health, the Institute of Medicine recommended the development of a worldwide disease surveillance system. Uh, this recommendation was made again in the IOM's 2003 update to the 92 report. Can you tell us what steps the administration has taken to implement this recommendation and what steps are planned for the future? Uh, well, I think I can try to address what steps that we've been taking at, at CDC and in HHS to uh, work collaboratively uh, with the World Health Organization to try to enhance global capacity to be able to address the threat of emerging infectious diseases. Um, uh, again, as was mentioned, uh, we've been providing resources to WHO so that they can do their job better. WHO has been working, um, and, and I think we're seeing the fruits of many of the things that WHO has done in terms of their ability to work collaboratively with all of the countries in uh, Asia that are affected by this and to be able to monitor the world situation. They have a global alerting network that they've built. Um, uh, to be able to rapidly provide information about outbreaks that are occurring in other parts of the world. We support that. In addition to that, we are working towards building similar types of programs to those that I described in Connecticut uh, in other parts of the world as well. Um, this is a program that we've just started within the past um, uh, couple of years. Uh, one of them uh, currently exists in Thailand, in Bangkok, and that program itself has been one of the instrumental tools that we've had uh, to help provide assistance in Asia uh, with the SARS problem. And so we have been working um, to try to improve global capacity, um, but I, I think that there would be little question, both in our minds as well as in the minds of WHO, that there's a great deal that more that needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, in October 2001, the, the minority staff of, of this committee reported on the growing problem of ambulance diversions because of crowded emergency rooms in cities across the, the, the U.S. indicating serious implications for a public health crisis. Are there any known cases of ambulance diversions documented by public health authorities that relate to SARS? Uh, and, and if so, how many and when did it, did it occur? I, I am not aware of specific circumstances, but that doesn't mean they haven't necessarily occurred. Are um, SARS cases being turned away from medical facilities because of lack of uh, health care insurance um, that you know of? I, none that have particularly come to my attention. Others may have other information. Uh, obviously, the many health facilities around the country are very concerned about the potential risk that such patients may pose. 
uh, from our perspective, it's important that all hospitals have the appropriate infection control procedures and precautions in all, both outpatient as well as inpatient settings so that these people can be appropriately cared for. Okay, can, can this uh, disease manifest itself in our food and water supply? Um, it's, it's way too early to be able to answer those types of questions. Again, you're, 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 we're, we're basing everything on, on knowing about the existence of the virus itself for only two weeks. And uh, it's, it's far too soon to be able to answer those types of questions. Okay. And then uh, along those lines, then, are, is, is there any reason to think that SARS is or is not related to a bioterrorism effort? Well, as the Secretary mentioned, all of the information that we have currently available to us suggests that this is a naturally occurring event. Uh, nature, you know, has a lot of um, um, uh, tricks up its sleeve of its own. And uh, these viruses are constantly changing and mutating, and we constantly are seeing uh, new naturally occurring emerging infectious diseases. However, we haven't done everything that we need to do until we've been able to look at the entire genetic sequence of the virus uh, to be able to say with 100 percent certainty that that might not be the case. We remain open to that possibility. But at least everything that we've heard up to this point suggests that this is naturally occurring. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for your answers. Doctor, we're almost done. I would just like to ask you uh, a few questions, and then we'll get to the next panel, and maybe the Governor has a question or two to follow up. Uh, I am, um, I, I want to understand, because we've said it, I want to know if it's true. Is this a highly contagious disease uh, or is it not? In a scale of 1 to 10, how does it fit in, 10 being highly contagious? Well, I'm not sure that we necessarily have all of the answers yet to be able to, to, to properly give it a score. It's, it's uh, what I can it, say is that in most circumstances, it does not appear to be highly transmissible. However, what concerns us is that we have seen a number of instances uh, in Asia and also in Toronto where there seems to be what the Secretary referred to as the super spreaders. Um, where all of a sudden we see explosive numbers of cases in their close contacts, particularly in the healthcare setting. And um, uh, as I'm sure many are aware, in the apartment complex in, in Hong Kong and in the hotel setting in Hong Kong as well, and we need to understand a little bit better the circumstances of those particular events and why they happen and what may have been responsible for why one individual seems to transmit the disease to so many people while in the vast majority of cases they don't seem to do that. It may simply happen, have something to do with the stage of disease. It may have something to do with the severity of the illness at the time that that individual was being cared for or was around. So we can't say with absolute certainty. So I can't give you a, a definite score. But certainly if you look at a virus, say, like measles, where almost everybody that's within an area will, um, uh, you know, if they're not vaccinated, will, that are exposed, will develop the disease. It doesn't appear to be, uh, to have that degree of contagiousness. But again, most of these respiratory viruses go from one person to another. And, um, and, and, and until we gather more information, we can't say exactly what degree of contagiousness this one has. What is the uh, sense of um, our ability? How do we determine whether something is natural or by, by the malevolent act of man uh, something tampered with? How do we know whether it's uh, uh, it's an act of a terrorist or just a natural act of? Well, again, it's looking at the structures of the virus itself and there's looking a way at the genetic tell? material and, and, and looking to see whether or not there are sequences that would correspond with other sequences that would suggest that maybe something was introduced into the virus. Um, all, all of that, you know, would go into uh, making a determination that something may not necessarily be natural. Let me be clear on this. Do we learn from analyzing the, the virus, the pathogen, or do we learn by just tracking it down to, the, to its beginning and then learn that way? Well, um, it's both, um, okay. uh, clearly. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we uh, have been making such great efforts to try to get back to some of these very early cases. 
uh, in Guangdong province so that we could learn about the types of exposures that these individuals had that may give us some clue as to exactly what you're talking about. But, but um, a lot of it is also based on what we learn about the virus itself. You're one seat over from a, a gentleman who was at our hearing on national security about three years ago. Uh, and he closed, uh, he was a, a doctor of a major medical magazine, and he shared with us his biggest concern. His biggest concern was that a small group of dedicated scientists would alter a biological agent such that there would be no antidote and it would wipe out humanity as we know it. He was not saying that in, a, in an attempt to draw attention. He was just on, answering an honest a question and giving an honest answer. That scared the hell out of me, though. And um, it, it makes me uh, very interested just to come back again, because I don't have a handle or a sense of the concept of surveillance, which we believe is the most important issue. Uh, I think the Secretary does has, has said that. Uh, when will a national surveillance system with real-time data be put in place? Well, uh, what I can say in, in, in addressing that issue is this is a system that we are working on, developing. Right. Um, we are looking at ways to access data on a real-time basis at the national level, collect that information, be able to analyze it and look for aberrancies. Um, that work is going on as we speak. It's a, it's a system that we refer to as biointelligence. And um, when will this biointelligence, when do you think, what's your timetable for getting this in place? Um, we, we hope that we will be able to um, move towards uh, pilots uh, of such a system in the not too distant future. When will right. a national system be in place? I think it's a I, I don't know, like not, not too distant future. I got to right. pin you down a little more. This well, is too important. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, do you, you have to have some time. Uh, if you want to say within the next year or you want to say within the next five years. Well, uh, we would certainly hope to have pilots in place within the next year, Congressman. Okay. Within the next 12 months. And, and what does pilots mean? Well, again, to, to look at different mechanisms to be able to collect the information and try to figure out which is the best way to do it efficiently. Okay. So presently, we have an ad hoc, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way, but we have a basic ad hoc system <coughs> that hospitals report uh, to the states in some states and that you try to grab any information where you can get it directly from the states or directly from New York City and maybe the state of New York, any way you can do it and you're trying to compile it. But right now, we don't have a nationwide uh, system that captures in real time all the data around the country uh, in, an, in a, a matter of seconds or minutes uh, all at once to be able to compare data. Right? No, I think it's fair to say that we don't have such a system, but I'd also point out to you that that, that, that at least in our experience, a one-size-doesn't-fit-all system and what might necessarily work, say, in Connecticut may not necessarily work in Los Angeles. That's why we've been, you know, with the, with the bioterrorism resources, one of the major efforts uh, of those resources is to develop the type of syndromic surveillance that you've been describing. And there are many different models that are being used at the state and local level to be able to do that. Okay, let me just say, my time is running. I'm just going to go a, second, a few minutes longer and then uh, go to my other colleagues. Just be very brief. Sure. sure. Very briefly. I, I have three very quick questions. One, you, you say there's indications that it may be weaker in this country. Does that give us hope that this thing may kind of peter itself out as it continues to move through society, that there's a, 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 a ideological reason for it? Right. I, I, th I think, I think the, Congressman, the term weaker is probably not the right term. The, the spectrum of illness that we've seen so far in the United States seems to be milder than what's been seen elsewhere. We believe that that's probably a phenomenon of the fact that we're casting a very wide net. And as you cast a wide net and become less specific in terms of what you're looking for, to try to be as sensitive as possible to find all even theoretically possible cases, we're probably picking up people with milder illness who have something else. This, sir, the second thing, when you were asked a question by the gentleman from Maryland about cooperation, you took a deep breath, let it out, and you said, on balance, things are highly collaborative. 
Is there a problem at all with collaboration with the other health agencies in the country? And, and I realize I put you on the spot, sir, but it's right. very important as we're talking about this kind of problem. Right. Uh, I, uh, Congressman, what I can say is that we work on a highly collaborative basis with all of our partners at the state health departments. Is that happening now with this disease? With Absolutely. This okay. All of, uh, you know, we've had, uh, uh, currently we've had reports of suspected cases um, from, from uh, you know, that, that we've been including on our line listing from at least 30 states. I don't know what today's count will be, but at least 30 different states. And in addition to that, um, there have been many hundreds more individuals that have either directly contacted us, their health care providers have contacted us, well, I'm talking us, about the, the states have, not the individuals. Or the, or the states have, and, and we have worked collaboratively with every single health department in this country to be able to investigate those cases and One figure out question. whether they meet our definition. Thank you. One last question, sir. The, 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 there's a suspicion that this may have jumped from animals to people. How do we know of any animal that has carried this disease in the past that gives us that suspicion? Right. This coronavirus, at least based on the work that we've done up to this point, appears to be unique and new, uh, different than other coronaviruses that we've seen. Uh, we do know that there are a number of coronaviruses that naturally infect animals. And so what we've been doing is we've been doing additional work to actually look at the virus itself and see if it will give us any clues as to the type of animal that it may have come from. We're not there yet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we'll almost be done here. Uh, this is a live fire exercise. If it was more contagious, obviously uh, we would be presented with a more difficult challenge. Uh, there's nothing. Uh, in uh, nature's law that says there couldn't be something more contagious, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So in one sense, this is a good practice for us. Would you agree? Uh, well, well, all I can say is that we remain highly concerned about the, even this particular virus and the potential impact that it can have, not only around the world, but also here in the United States. Okay. I think we have to be very vigilant about the potential for this okay. virus. And we have to move as quickly as we can to get those pilot programs Absolutely. moving. And uh, I think, frankly, if I could express an, an opinion, not a question, a, a little more forcefully, I think that the Secretary and you and others have to be a, a little more outspoken. I tend to think that, that the Secretary doesn't want to alarm people, because obviously that's not healthy. But at the same time, he doesn't want us to feel like things are moving along and we don't need more resources or we don't need more legislation. It strikes me uh, that we need to uh, push the surveillance as quickly as we can. It, it's a fact, isn't it, that, that a terrorist act could tamper with a biological agent or they could take a natural agent uh, and just try to spread it. And then it's a little more difficult to know because you can't know from looking at the virus or the pathogen where it hasn't been altered, it hasn't been changed, it's natural in that sense, correct? Um, that's correct. I mean, uh, it's important to have some baseline of other viruses to be able to compare it to. And one last area, real quick. The, um, at one point, we were going to s destroy the smallpox virus, both sides. The Russians had it, we had it. And there were a number of us who said, we're not sure that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I, even within uh, HHS, also had some concerns. But ultimately, we didn't do it. And it's probably proves wise that we haven't. But in the process of creating a, a vaccine, is it possible that someone can take from a vaccine uh, and create uh, the virus from a vaccine? Um, is that possible? Well, it, it, you know, to some degree, it depends on the virus. Um, we certainly know of many live virus vaccines where, and, and probably the best example of that would be, for instance, polio, uh, where, where the, even the, the, the vaccine strains can revert themselves um, uh, in nature to become more virulent and actually produce disease. And yeah, so it's theoretically possible to do that. What about smallpox? Well, the smallpox is, is, is not so much of an issue because the vaccine itself is a different virus. Well, uh, let me ask you this, though. Why is it, though, that if a, one partner in a marriage uh, can't take the vaccine, the other doesn't. 
I mean, in other words, if you're pregnant, you choose not to. So it, you, the, the husband is, is determined that he should not, you know, have uh, the small. Right. And why would that be? Well, because the, 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 the virus itself is transmissible from one individual to another through direct contact. Well, it's, it's, and because of that and because of the health threat that the virus could pot potentially pose to pregnant women and other people with immunocompromised health conditions, um, the recommendation is that if there is someone in your household who fits into one of those categories that you defer from okay, vaccination. I don't want to dwell on this. I just want to understand it, though. I want to understand that is that are you saying, in essence, that someone could basically have the vaccine? Is it called a vaccine? Smallpox vaccine? The smallpox vaccine is yeah, vaccinia. So, right. Okay. You have the vaccine. Uh, it's possible that someone could contract smallpox from a person who has had it. I'm seeing a shaking no. of head behind. No, not I, smallpox. Okay, they some can, other... They, it, it, vaccinia, in some circumstances, okay. can produce illness. Okay, it would be an illness, but not... Okay. Not smallpox. Happy to have that on the record. Okay. We'll be real clear. You can't right. transmit it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, doctor. Excuse me, do either gentleman have a question? Okay. Just ahead here on C-SPAN 2, a report on congressional spending released by the group Citizens Against Government Waste. In about 30 minutes, Supreme Court Justices Clark